Welcome everybody. We do plan to get started right now. Uh, my name is Rick Hansen and I'm your local history librarian. And we're connecting from many different locations with Zoom. Now Zoom may be new to some of you and we're using the Zoom webinar format this afternoon to better accommodate a great audience. So we cannot see or hear you and you cannot see or hear each other. But take a moment to explore the features of Zoom, if you will, and you will locate a Q&A section to submit questions you have during the presentations. Uh, we have reserve time at the end, at which point I can read submitted questions to our panel. We do plan to record today so we can use this video later. The Greenwich Library is here with you and always available to respond to phone and web inquiries Monday through Saturday. The Pollinator Pathway is a collaboration of local organizations, town governments, conservancies, and trusts, totaling over 20 groups and numerous volunteers in Greenwich alone. The group is not only in Connecticut, but also New York and Pennsylvania. The goal is to create a corridor of contiguous pollinator-friendly properties. Uh, the basic criteria for creation of a pollinator pathway is that it collects large, connects large natural areas and ensures proper plant density to suppress invasive species growth. This afternoon's presentation is expected to run about 40 or 45 minutes and there will be time afterwards for your questions, as I mentioned. So without any further delay, I'm excited to welcome our panelists and I'll ask our panelists to please turn on their videos. Now they may not appear on your screen in the same order, but I will introduce them in the order of our planned presentation. Dan Brubaker will speak first. Dan is the Conservation Outreach Manager at the Greenwich Land Trust, originally founded over 50 years ago, and he will help us, help us meet the pollinators. Alexandra Mock helped to organize today's event and she will speak second. She is the Environmental Analyst on the Conservation Commission with the Town of Greenwich, and she'll talk about local efforts. Myra Klokenbrick is uh, very involved with sustainability in Greenwich, and she will speak third. Myra wears many hats, including membership with the Greenwich Recycling Advisory Board and Waste Free uh, Greenwich, just to mention a few, and she'll talk about harmful pesticides. Dr. Greg Kramer is a Superintendent of Parks and Trees and Tree Warden for Greenwich Department of Parks and Recreation, and he will offer our last presentation discussing what you can do to help. Karen DeWall will help us during the panelist discussion portion of today's webinar. Karen is an appointed chair with the Green Fingers Garden Club, originally founded in the 1930s, so we're thrilled to have her here as well. Uh, we're fortunate to have them continue their expertise in Greenwich with great care for the environment. So starting us off is Dan. Um, everyone else will please turn off their videos and Dan will share his screen. Dan, I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Rick, thanks for the introduction. Um, and as Rick mentioned, uh, my name is Dan Brubaker and I'm uh, the Conservation Outreach Manager at Greenwich Land Trust. Um, I also run our C to C program, which uh, is very much integrated into um, the concept of the pollinator pathway, which uh, means that we are focused on uh, harvesting seeds from our um, local environment, specifically from land trust properties, and then propagating those seeds and planting them back out into our preserves um, the next year, uh, which really helps to improve diversity and um, establish native seed populations and native plant populations. So what we're talking about today is um, native pollinators and uh, why they're valuable. And um, I wanna give you an idea of sort of who they are, what insects are doing the pollinating, and uh, some of the issues surrounding having pollinators and why they're important. Um, first off, what is pollination? Most of you who have algaes are well aware of some of the plants that are wind pollinated. Um, there's sort of two categories of pollination. Um, those that are pollinated by the wind um, tend to be senior pine trees and um, some other uh, flowering plants that you often don't notice their flowers um, because they don't need to attract insects. They're, they're spreading their pollen through the wind. Um, and then other ones, um, which are mostly the plants we're interested in, which are a lot of our food plants, um, fruit, vegetables, um, along with a lot of the flowers. So basically if a plant has a flower that is um, colorful and pretty, uh, it's probably gonna be pollinated by insects. Um, so those are the plants that we are focused on when we're talking about our pollinator gardens and our native plants. Um, it doesn't mean the other plants aren't important. Um, they are, they create diversity in the same way but um, the ones we're sort of focused on now are a lot of the, the insect pollinated plants. Um, so what animals are actually doing the pollinating? Uh, it depends where you are in the country. In the Northeast here, most of our pollinating is done by insects. And the one that most people are familiar with is gonna be the honeybee. 
And that's just because they're um, really common. You have beekeepers with them all over the country. And the ironic thing is that they actually are not a native species. Um, but at this point, they have integrated pretty well into our ecosystem and are often uh, treated sort of as a native species. Um, so they're often supported in the same way and um, seen as desirable. Uh, they don't seem to create major problems for other, for other insects. So honeybee is a really common pollinator, especially for a lot of our food crops. Um, but when it comes to our wildflowers and other native plants, um, the other group that a lot of people are probably familiar with are the butterflies and maybe less so the moths. And these are slightly different from some of the other insects in that they are primarily interested in the um, pollinating plants is the nectar. So the plants create nectar and provide that as a um, attractant for insects and other animals in exchange for that animal then hopefully uh, carrying some of the pollen to another flower. So a lot of the butterflies are primarily interested in, in the nectar of the flower and then they might um, by accident be carrying uh, the pollen as well. Um, animals like honeybees um, and bumblebees will also consume the pollen, so they are visiting the flowers for both the nectar and the pollen. Um, some animals that don't get quite as much attention uh, are some of the other bees. Uh, we mentioned that the honeybees aren't native, but we have over 4,000 um, species of native bees throughout North America, so there are plenty of native bees. Most of them are solitary. Most don't really sting much. Um, they're not defensive really at all. Um, so most of these little bees, along with wasps, bumblebees, uh, the one on the bottom left there is a fly species. So most of these tiny little insects that are pollinating, um, sweat bees would be in this category, don't really sting much. They're, they're definitely not aggressive um, and they're not really gonna hurt um, to have in your garden. Um, and this time of year is actually a great time to see a lot of these smaller insects um, because they love the uh, multifaceted flowers that come with plants like goldenrods and uh, asters, which are really prominent for us in the Northeast in the fall season. Um, so this is a group of, of animals, of insects that doesn't get quite the attention sometimes, but actually are often far more efficient pollinators than either butterflies or honeybees and are far more common than people realize. Um, there are some other animals that pollinate in the Northeast here. We have a few hummingbirds that will do that. Uh, but in terms of bats, you have to go to other parts of the country, generally in the Southwest. Um, so we are focused really on the insects. Um, really quickly on why they're important. Um, there's kind of two major categories to this. The first one is primarily food related. And uh, it's what we mentioned earlier, where many of our fruits and vegetables, uh, up to three quarters of our food produce that we, that we grow is reliant on some sort of insect to pollinate the flowers. Um, in order for them to produce fruit and go to seed. And for a lot of our crops, um, that's actually done by honeybees, but uh, more naturally that would have been done by all of those thousands of native bees and other insects um, that are also uh, doing work pollinating. Another aspect of pollinators that makes them incredibly important is their um, production towards the food web. Uh, so much of the food web, much of the food chain is actually built on top of these pollinators. Most of them are insects, and while we might see the butterfly or the moth um, or the beetle, we don't see all of the larvae that um, are the young butterflies and young moths and the young beetles. And they are vital to um, much of our, our food web that um, we have here in the Northeast. So most of our songbirds are going to be feeding their chicks on uh, caterpillars, which are larvae of some sort of pollinator, generally. Um, and even if it's not songbirds, most of the other uh, predators in our food web are either directly eating insects or eating something that's eating insects. So they're really the foundation of a healthy ecosystem. And that sort of gets us into why natives are important. There's definitely a strong relationship between um, a healthy pollinator population and a healthy native plant population. Um, generally in ecosystems you have a really close biological relationship between um, an insect species and a certain group or even a certain species of plant. So in the bottom left there you might see a leaf miner that might only be on a certain type of aster or a certain type of goldenrod and if you remove that specific species of goldenrod you will lose that species of leaf miner. So there's generally a very strong relationship between having a lot of species diversity in your plant life and having high species diversity in your insect populations. 
And that diversity does um, a lot of really important things for stabilizing an ecosystem. Generally, the more complex your ecosystem is, um, the more species you have in that ecosystem, the more resilient it is going to be to stressors. Um, these days, those stressors could be normal things like uh, fragmentation of population, um, having habitat destroyed. But on a larger scale, uh, climate change is something that uh, when you have less complex ecosystems, they can be, become much more um, at risk uh, for things like climate change. Um, and one really good example of this is our um, native trees. Um, a lot of times we have ornamental trees in our yards that look really pretty, but if you look at the biology surrounding those trees, something like an oak, if you have a white oak in your yard, a large white oak, you might have 400 species, 500 species of insects that are feeding on it. Um, that means they're raising their larva on it. Birds are able to collect that larva for food. They're providing a huge engine of resources for the local environment. Um, you can compare that to something like a ginkgo species. Um, it might only host five native insects, um, insect species. So you can start to see how that complexity can be built or lost depending on how um, many native plants you have. Um, so lastly, just really briefly on sort of our primary threats to a lot of our pollinators. Um, many of them have been going on for years, for decades. Uh, generic development is always going to be a problem for native species um, because you have fragmentation, general loss of habitat, um, but more specifically, even things like having large areas of, of yard, specifically if you're treating them with pesticides um, or even some herbicides, you can create what are essentially wastelands for pollinators. Um, and that's exasperated by things like direct insecticide spraying on a large scale um, for large scale agriculture. So hopefully that's just a really brief introduction of um, some of the pollinators we have here, uh, why we want to be uh, planting native plants and, and why those things are important for developing pollinator um, diversity. Um, so Alex is gonna be presenting next. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my video and um, turn my um, video off and um, Alex, if you could turn yours on and share your screen. Um, Alex is going to be uh, speaking about local efforts surrounding um, pollinator habitat. Hello, my name is Alexandra Mark and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, our efforts, uh, as Dan uh, mentioned. And um, Rick is going to be helping me with my uh, slides. Um, so um, we're going to be focusing on our very exciting project, which is the first mile long pollinators pathway in Greenwich. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, so Rick already uh, explained on the, what the pollinators pathway is, and uh, we are creating those connectors, and those connectors we're taking opportunity of how we're connecting, uh, how we're creating them. So they're obviously full of plants which are attractive to pollinators, including improving their habitats, and then those little connectors are actually leading to building corridors. And corridors are not only friendly for the pollinators, but they are envisioned to be friendly for the entire wildlife population. And why they are so important? Because of the climate change, uh, they are going to be, the wildlife is going to be uh, migrating towards north as the temperature is uh, heating up. And also um, they are important to connect those uh, fragmented uh, open space areas which we have left in our town. Next. Um, we also have uh, a program for uh, all of you, and uh, one of them is a garden certification program. And Karen DeWall, who is here with us today, uh, she's leading the program. And just quickly uh, to describe it, uh, we have uh, four different steps we are paying attention to when we're analyzing your garden. Um, so it has to have a, a native species. It could have some ornamentals, uh, that's fine, but predominantly native and it is important that they supply the nectar um, and the pollen throughout the growing season, which is the early um, spring and late fall. Um, water source, so some of you may have natural water source, um, uh, pond, a stream, or a, maybe a spring, but if not, um, um, a little uh, rain garden or um, bird bath, uh, would also cover. Shelter. Um, we may not like um, uh, untidy gardens and most of us has a tendency to have a, 
uh, very manicured gardens. Uh, but if you have a larger garden, it is good to have uh, some area which has a, a pile of stone, a pile of branches, and also some exposed area where the pollinators like to nest in. Um, if you don't and your garden is very small and limited, you can do uh, man-made bee houses. And uh, I will show you one of the examples um, later on. The health of your yard is very important. As uh, Dan mentioned, uh, pesticides, um, uh, synthetic fertilizers and herbicides are a huge threat to pollinators. Also, uh, you may not be aware that uh, all, most of the mulches, which are very colorful, they are actually treated chemically and uh, most of them uh, include pesticides on them. So please uh, pay attention to them and we would love you to maintain it organically. Use what you have, reuse the grass clippings, reuse the leaves, shred them into the soil. Not only you improving the soil quality and the moisture and uh, but also you are um, uh, expanding and uh, offering much better habitat for uh, wildlife. And if you need to fertilize, please use organic fertilizers. Next. Um, so who is behind all those efforts? Uh, and we are very, very fortunate to have such a wide variety of um, uh, organizations and volunteers. As you see on our list is Audubon, Land Trust, we have Girl Scouts, we have garden group groups, we have uh, community gardens, um, we have nurseries, um, and all of those people are bringing such a knowledge and experience. And uh, so we can move forward and this is really, really helpful. Next slide. So location, um, so we wanted to start with building the first pollinators pathway in Greenwich and we we're looking for location for uh, a long time. And uh, we decided on North Street. And why North Street? Uh, because it uh, engages several, not only different wildlife habitats, but also our ownerships. So our partners pathway, it's uh, expanding from um, uh, North Street School, which is a public school, all the way to Greenwich Catholic School, a private school. Uh, along the way, we have a cemetery, we have a nursery, we have um, a single Mm, property developers um, and uh, private uh, ownerships. Uh, so it's uh, very diverse, but also in terms of uh, natural environment, we have different habitats. So the pathway expands from one pond located at Grange Catholic School to a very tiny pond uh, on the uh, North, Street School, uh, North Street School. In between, we are connecting um, a beautiful meadow at Sunbridge Nursery um, and also uh, woodland, uh, which is owned by the town of Greenwich. Um, the next, please. Um, so the purpose of uh, the first section, and it's a, a very small section, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's to create a healthy habitat. And actually, it's uh, to set an example. So visitors can come and take a look at the different plants which we are using and also the important interaction between the pollinators and uh, the newly planted areas. We'd like to emphasize that um, healthy habitat for pollinators is not just all the beautifully uh, flowering uh, plants, herbaceous plants, but also they need shrubs and they need uh, trees. Uh, because of the uh, close proximity to North Street School, we are hoping that this, is, this becomes uh, their outdoor classrooms um, and also open uh, to citizen science so uh, people can do census on pollinators. Uh, we will offer workshops and uh, the most important, uh, promote the pesticide-free zones. Next. Uh, funding uh, was something which uh, kept us uh, from acting for a long, long time. And we were very thankful when Sustainable Connecticut uh, started their new program. And Greenwich uh, is part of Sustainable Connecticut program. Uh, so what they offer, they offer community match fund. Uh, so we requested to raise uh, over $11,000 with them. So their match wa was one to one. So we didn't have to go all the way up to 11,000, we just had to raise half of it. So we have developed a uh, well-planned um, campaign. We were using IOB platform, uh, which is the crowdfunding uh, place. 
And uh, over four weeks, uh, we're, we're fortunate to uh, get 15 different donors and we raise all the money uh, in a, a shorter period of time than we um, uh, expected. The next please. Uh, here's a, a very foggy uh, set of uh, photographs. I would like to apologize for the quality. Uh, so basically this is before and how this area looks like. So the area is, uh, is located or was located between the woodland and North Street. Um, and uh, the area was uh, choked by invasive species. So it was cleared and prepared for our plantings. Next piece. Uh, so this little rectangular uh, area is a, a sketch of uh, what is happening there. And um, um, the, uh, the area which is in green, full green, uh, are the areas which were planted. The gray um, lines are the pathways which were used for weeding, access and watering. Uh, the large circles are the existing trees which were incorporated to the new landscape. And then the smaller circles were shrubs. And uh, you can actually see some of the uh, plants which were planted. So we have Bonset, which was donated by Grand Land Trust. We have Foxglove, we have uh, Mountain Mint, we have Aster, we have uh, Black Eyed Susan and Milkweed. So that little area where they are growing is our donation place. And so far we had two donors of plants. So uh, they were all donated, well donated. And also we have some uh, shrubs, which uh, is the sweet pepper bush and uh, allspice. Um, and next week, if you would like to join us, we're going to start planting another uh, 3000 uh, plugs uh, that are coming and our planting will start on Tuesday at nine o'clock and also uh, Thursday at nine o'clock. Um, so we have way to go um, with the new plants, but hopefully after the planting next week, we're going to be able to fill this entire area and then you will see the, the effect uh, we've created. The next please. So this is for the work in progress and when you start with uh, plugs, they are very small plants and they are not flowering right away. So um, even if you see those areas planted, they are not really flowering and they are not really that attractive. Um, but uh, they will as soon as uh, the plants will start growing. The next please. So here um, are our uh, additional improvements. So we uh, installed a big butterfly, metal butterfly at the entrance and also we have some description of what this whole project is all about. We installed some birdhouses and those logs which you can see on the right hand side is our indoor classroom and they were all set up uh, six feet apart so we're hoping that the students will discover them and use them uh, for exploring the area. The next. Maintenance is ongoing, especially this year. Um, summer was uh, very, very dry. So we had to do everyday watering and also uh, bi-weekly weeding. And um, um, on the right uh, picture, you can see I Black Susan, uh, which were uh, just donated and we planted them as well. Next, please. Lessons learned. Um, um, make sure that uh, everything is being planned um, uh, with, the ti with good timing. What we had, we had an excellent uh, and very diverse um, list of plants, but unfortunately uh, by the time we have received our uh, funding and we finished our fundraising, uh, whatever was left uh, at the nursery were only a few species because it was the end of the uh, planting season um, and we're getting ready into an early summer. Um, invasive species tends to fight back, so we have to keep in mind that this area was cleared from invasive species and they keep coming back and they are usually our main weeds which we keep uh, pulling out. Uh, volunteers are easy to lose, especially when COVID hits and you have a very hot summer days. Um, and um, as we've seen on the pictures, plug do not offer instant gratification. Uh, but um, 
if you build it, they will come. So as soon as we brought those plugs in, they were immediately discovered by all the pollinators. Uh, so they visited the site, they exploded, exploded and uh, they stayed. Um, and beneficial projects received funds. So as uh, I said, we didn't really have a uh, problem to raise uh, our amount. That's very exciting. And it's all because we were working with Sustainable Connecticut and the IOB uh, platform. The next. Uh, thank you so much for listening uh, and allowing me to introduce our group. Uh, here is uh, the um, address uh, to our website if you would like to uh, learn more details. And if you would like to sign in and become part of our group, um, you'll be more than welcomed. Um, you can contact me anytime, Alexandra Mock at Conservation Commission. Thank you. Oh, and uh, the next person uh, speaking is uh, Myra, and she's going to be talking about pesticides. And pesticides are our major threat, uh, threats to the pollinators. And uh, it's good that uh, each of us can do something about it. And because we are making those choices every day, how we're treating our uh, lawn and how we're treating our landscape. Um, so Myra is going to be expanding on it. Hello everyone, my name is Myra Klockenbrink and I am a homeowner like you. I have a yard and a lawn, I grow a few vegetables and I have a small pollinator garden. And I have become very, um, I am interested in creating a habitat that is conducive to the health of all the animals that visit my garden, especially pollinating insects. Um, I have learned that pollinating insects perform all kinds of important functions in the home garden ecosystem, including pollination, so that plants can reproduce and provide forage and food for animals like birds and ultimately for human beings. Today I wanted to talk to you about how to avoid pesticide use in the home garden landscape and how you can create a garden that is vibrant, dynamic, and very beautiful. I wanted to take you from the hazards of chemical sprays to best practices that bring diversity into the landscape. From a yard and garden that is neat and controlled with pesticides to a yard and garden that is full of life. Pesticides are synthetic chemicals commonly used in the home garden landscape. They treat plant disease or kill plants. They also repel or destroy perceived pests like insects. Neonicotinoids are neurotoxic chemicals related to nicotine that act on certain receptors in the nerve synapse. One thing that has made them very popular in pest control is their water solubility, which allows them to be applied directly to the soil and be taken up by the plants, not only by their stems and leaves, but by their nectar and pollen as well. Glyphosate is an herbicide, commonly known as Roundup, that is sprayed on the plant causing its leaves to drop. Genetically modified plants, usually crop plants like corn and soy, have been developed to be resistant to glyphosate so that an entire field can be sprayed and only the crop plant remains unaffected. That means that any plants growing even at the margins or at a distance from the field can be affected. Millions of American households use pesticides. 92 million pounds are used by households and the landscape professionals they hire every year using pesticides has become as common as using soap. I should mention to, uh, that the European Union and Canada have made neonicotide use unlawful and have sharply curbed the use of glyphosate. Consumers cannot buy it over the counter. Why do people use pesticides? Well, they use them to kill insects they use them to kill weeds, 
to create a perfect lawn. They use them because they are part of the service their landscapers provide. And homeowners use pesticides because it's expected from their homeowners association, their neighborhood, or their neighbors. Peer pressure is a thing. The problem with pesticides is that they are ubiquitous and used worldwide in practically every corner of the planet. The plants and insects that are targeted by these chemicals develop resistance to them. As a consequence, they are used more often and in greater quantities. Evidence is showing that these chemicals are carcinogenic with repeated and long-term use and they can persist in the environment for a long time. These chemicals leach into the soil where they build up killing soil organisms. New evidence is emerging that they decrease mycorrhiza in the soil, the microbial and fungal network that nourishes trees and gives soil the ability to sequester carbon. As a footnote, Soils are the largest terrestrial reservoir for carbon and may provide the best way to remove carbon from the atmosphere. It is important to keep our soils healthy. Many of these pesticides are water soluble and as they build up in the environment, they can be washed into our water supply and ultimately, in our case, into Long Island Sound where they can affect marine life. These chemicals are known to be dangerous to young bodies, to our pets, to other animals, um, mammals in our landscape, and to amphibians in our wet areas. They even show up in our food. The long-term and persistent use of these chemicals is doing its job too well. Insecticides do not discriminate bees and other pollinating insect populations are collapsing. Honeybee numbers dropped 45% in the last year. A British study made headlines for warning that 40% of all insect species worldwide are in decline and could die out in the coming decades. Evidence is also mounting that these chemicals affect bird populations. Birds depend upon insects, especially their larvae, what we know as caterpillars, to feed their young. Because insect populations have dropped dramatically, birds no longer have sufficient forage to sustain their numbers. I want to tell you what you can do in the face of this really catastrophic picture. The first thing you can do is to buy native plants that have evolved in this area of the country. They have the best chance to thrive and they are less susceptible to disease and pests than non-native plants. Learn about your soil, what nutrients it may lack, its texture, if it's sandy, or if it's full of clay, would indicate that it needs specific kind of plants for your garden to do well. Select the right plant for the right place, whether it's a container or a formal planting bed. See where you have sun or where you have more shady conditions, where you have access to water and where it might be dry and site your plants accordingly. Buy organically grown. A lot of nurseries don't know if their plants have been propagated organically, but ask and shop for plants that have not been treated Customer demand informs supply. When you're planning your gardens, consider companion planting, where plants that are vulnerable to insect damage are sided with plants that repel those same insects. Cover crops are often used in agriculture to overwinter fields to the following spring, but they can also be used in your home garden to keep beds nourished from season to season. Rethink what damage to plants you can tolerate. A few leaves with holes can easily be removed if they bother your sensibilities and on their own do not really mar the beauty of your beds. Perfection is a devil's game because it's never really achieved and we miss 
so much interest along the way. And if you take your time, especially in the early part of the spring season when the weeds are young, you can remove them easily. It's a pleasurable meditative chore. I always say the minute you touch the soil, your cares go away. Mulching your garden with leaves has multiple benefits. They hold in moisture, they nourish the soil, they discourage weeds, and they provide habitat for other creatures. Be sure to create an alliance with an expert or knowledgeable help. It could be your cooperative extension, the Greenwich Botanic Center, or a garden club like Green Fingers, a representative of which we have here today. Talk to your landscapers and let them know you do not want pesticides use on your property. Shop for services that provide organic lawn care. Some even use electric mowers and blowers that do not contribute as much to air and noise pollution. And you may also want to reconsider your idea of what a weed is. Many of them are beautiful in their own right and have multiple benefits in the environment. They come in all kinds of colors and sizes, and they often do double duty in the garden by providing habitat, color, and often fragrance. Another thing you can do is learn about the insects that visit your garden and get curious about their life. They too come in different sizes and shapes and colors, and they can really be quite fascinating once you get to know them better. So make friends with an insect and you may be surprised at their beauty, their versatility, their function, and even their humor. A garden that welcomes weeds and insects has many delights and will not fail to inspire you as you get to know your wild friends better. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing and turn off my video and mute. Yes, and thank you, Myra. And we're going to turn it over to Greg. And Greg's going to share his screen and let us know what we can do to help. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, what a bunch of wonderful presentations. Uh, fantastic. What a, what a, well-versed group of, of uh, panelists we have here this afternoon. I wanna thank uh, the Grant Library for having this and hosting the event. Um, it's really wonderful and it's great outreach. So I did wanna, I did wanna start with um, talking about local initiatives supporting pollinators and what we can do um, some of the subject matter was covered, which is fantastic, and I'll just maybe elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, but what a, what a great subject matter. And kind of diving into it now, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we have here on the screen. We were talking about our local pollinators, and we have uh, two different species of our, our sweat bees, which are our native bees. And as Myra mentioned, uh, insects can be quite beautiful when you take the time to take a closer look at them. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about native plants that, that have form and function. Uh, you know, we want to, as gardeners and horticulturalists and environmentalists, uh, we tend to like the pretty things. Aesthetically pleasing plants are beautiful. They sell and they attract attention, um, but not all native plants necessarily need to function in that matter. And, uh, a lot of native plants that don't have that, that wow factor are, are quite important in the environment and for wildlife. Um, but 
again, we wanted plants, aesthetically pleasing plants. Uh, also with native plants, we want plants that can grow and proliferate with little inputs. That goes back to our earlier panelist discussions and talking about pesticides and water conservation and, and diseases. A lot of our native plants are well adapted to this environment and don't need much inputs. So that's another reason to, to concentrate on native plants. Another factor is decide whether you want to attract a broad spectrum of wildlife or specific species. And I wanted, to I wanted to discuss that a little bit more too in greater depth. Uh, what I have, the picture we have here is one of our native salvias. It's scarlet sage. It's a wonderful native plant. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about it in the next, the next slide. Uh, the attributes, it's native, annual that profusely recedes, which is great. That's what we're looking for. Grows in hot sun and fertile soils. Mm, sounds pretty good to me. Blooms until hard freeze, attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, bees, and wasps, and can compete with weeds. Again, that uh, sounds like a home run. Um, getting a little bit more into specifics, I did want to talk a little about, again, the broad, the broad spectrum, which was the salvia, and then some more specific plants that are that have very close relations with specific pollinators or the larva of those pollinators, and one being pawpaw. And uh, it's a wonderful native understory shrub that people may be familiar with or may not be familiar with. So I was gonna talk a bit more about that. And for those that want to attract butterflies or a specific type of butterfly, um, this is a plant you'd want to have in your garden. Uh, the attributes of pawpaw trees, they're native, they grow in dense shade, produce cover and habitat, mid-level and ground-dwelling animals. It's a mid-story uh, shrub, so it, it, it creates that center layer within the woodland. Uh, the fruit, if you ever had it, is quite delicious. It's in the uh, Anaceae family, which is a lot of our tropical fruits, such as soursop, uh, guanabana, and it's just as delicious as those tropical fruits. Uh, deer rarely browse it, which is fantastic for us here in Connecticut and other parts of the Northeast. Interesting flowers are pollinated by flies and beetles, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And it is the only host for the zebra swallowtail butterfly larva. So here's a picture of a pawpaw flower. Um, interesting, the color. Um, the color is, is a dark red, which is an attractive color for flies and beetles that feed on uh, carotid and, or dead animals. And the flowers themselves have a kind of um, musky smell. So here's an example of a plant that is not pollinated by butterflies or, or bees, but by flies or beetles. Here's a picture of the fruit. Um, it's, a quite, it's quite a large fruit. And again, it's, an, it's in a tropical family. And the taste is reminiscent of, I consider it a pineapple and banana together with little twists of apple. And here's our beautiful native zebra swallowtail butterfly that only lives on pawpaw trees. If you don't have pawpaw trees growing, you will not have this butterfly. Um, there are different species of pawpaw down further south, in particular in Florida, but the pawpaw range that does go up to Buffalo and into parts of Canada and kind of gets a little bit into Connecticut and parts of the Northeast is not a very common understory shrub. So this butterfly is not very common but it can be found where there is pawpaw populations in woodland settings. The other tree I did want to talk about is, is the hop tree, which is another great understory native tree that um, produces blooms in the spring, which many pollinators use. But again, I wanted to focus on the specifics. Uh, this tree is native to the Northeast and the Midwest and down South, and it's in the citrus family 
which is interesting because there are not many plants that, temperate plants that extend into the northern uh, hemisphere that are in the citrus family. The attributes of the hop tree is low maintenance native, blooms, many insects are attracted to the flowers, again in the citrus family, and deer do not browse it, which is a great attribute again in the northeast and its general area. Our giant swallowtail butterfly, if you want to attract this insect and have a reproductive population, you must have a hop tree in this area or plants in the citrus family. This is our largest native butterfly. It is spectacular and um, loves to visit gardens with an array of different flowers. But in order to reproduce, you need to have a hop tree. Uh, this is a picture I took down in Florida. The larva was on a, uh, a citrus type of plant known as Hercules Club. And that larva that looks like a bird dropping is actually this the swallowtail larva. It is in its larval phase, it looks like a bird dropping as an adaptation to avoid predation. Pretty interesting. I uh, just wanted to talk a little about careful when using non-native plants attracting natives, that being our black swallowtails. Um, everyone or may know that fennel is a great plant to have in the garden for black swallowtail butterfly larva. Um, what many people may not know is that in the west coast, fennel is a big invasive problem. Um, it's a bit of a warmer climate there. It does reproduce and grow prolifically. As we noticed with our warm, warming climate, it's something just to be aware of that um, sometimes native plants, although functioning well for now, non-native plants, I should say, that are functioning well now may not function well in the future. Um, what I used to do is I'd plant fennel and when it would go to seed, I would chop the seed heads off so that it would not reproduce in my garden. And here's a picture of black swallowtail, beautiful native butterfly. And of course, our monarch, I couldn't, couldn't do possibly a presentation without having a beautiful picture of our native monarch on a milkweed. Um, so I th thank you all. And I'm going to pass it back on to Rick and to Karen to open up the uh, Q&A panelist. And I wanted to leave some time, so I will zip off right now. Thank you all. Wow, thank you so much. What a great series of presentations. And uh, Greg, thanks for ending on that wonderful note. And I will ask all of our panelists to turn their videos back on. I may turn mine on and off occasionally, but I'd like to leave the floor to all of you. And uh, to start, we had a great question going for Dan. And I know, I believe Dan had a slide ready. I can turn Dan, Yes, go ahead, Dan. Would you like to address that, please? Sure. Yeah, somebody's asking, um, let me bring up my slide here, about what's actually flowering right now. And um, the fall in the Northeast is uh, best time for your asters um, and goldenrod specifically. They're sort of the classic Northeast flowering plants. Um, I want to address goldenrod specifically because um, it often it gets blamed for uh, being um, a problem for allergy sufferers. Uh, but a great thing to think about is that if the plant is being pollinated by insects, it is probably not responsible for your allergies. Um, so uh, when you look at research of um, what plants are providing the most resources for pollinators, goldenrod is often at the top of the list, along with some mountain mints, which aren't out right now. Um, so the biggest things you can either plant or look for right now uh, would be the goldenrods, um, any of those uh, field asters, um, the woodland asters, um, even the New England asters, uh, you'll see a lot of them driving around along the roadsides, um, specifically in wooded areas. Um, and another um, related group of, of plants are sort of the white snake root and bone sets. Um, they're blooming right now as well. Um, the white snake root is um, especially nice because it can be grown in some shade environments, um, but that's one that you see along a lot of highways in, along the forest edge. Um, you'll see big sections of white um, this time of year, and that's often from uh, the snake roots. Um, two others, ironweed and joe pieweed, are mostly finishing up um, right now, so you probably won't find them much, but uh, last month they would have been really prominent flowers. So this is the list um, that would be sort of really prominent right now, 
along with uh, a variety of other smaller species. Um, but really the asters and the, and the golden rods are the, the two that are sort of our primary focus at the moment. Wonderful, thank you, Dan. And I do see a question here also uh, from Diana, and this is for Alex. Uh, how hard is it to keep the invasive species you cleared at bay? How much human interaction do you need to keep that stuff away? Uh, well, it all depends uh, how often you visit the site. Um, uh, it could be done um, over a couple of years, I would think, I uh, would say. Um, and we do have an area which is behind the woods. Um, so we are um, restoring the area on the front of the woods, which you can see from North Street, but behind the, the woods, uh, there is an infestation of a Japanese knotweed, and we've been addressing this for the last five years. Um, it's getting better. We are um, kind of winning the battles, not yet, but uh, we can see actually uh, some negative effects on, on the plant we are making. But we used to have, uh, for example, bittersweet, which was uh, penetrating throughout the woodland. And we were really um, uh, successful with this. And, and uh, um, bittersweet is really, I, I think, the easiest plant to remove. Um, and then also we have wisteria and um, uh, what else is there? Um, many other species, which um, wisteria actually is the, the one which is uh, popping up the, the most often. And we have, um, what's the one with berries? Um, uh, can you someone help me out? Okay, possibly porcelain berry this time Yes, porcelain berries, thank porcelain you. Berry, yeah. um, so mm -hmm. these are two vines which, uh, which are uh, just showing up uh, the most often, but uh, we refuse to use pesticides and we're just doing everything by hand. And sooner or later, you're going to be successful. You just have to be persistent. There's a great question here, which might be for either Karen with the green fingers or with or for Alex or even Dan. Uh, they're asking, is seed to seed always uh, from a Greenwich seed or from a Connecticut seed? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that aspect? Yeah, if, if they're referring to um, the Land Trust seed to seed program, um, for that program, we are focused on uh, not just specifically Connecticut, but local seed stock, basically. So, I mean, New York is, is 10 minutes away, depending on where you live. Um, so our goal is to be collecting um, plants with local genotypes, which basically means that you're collecting plants that have genes that are adapted to our local environment here in Southwest Connecticut. Um, so that might extend up towards Hartford or down um, into New York. Uh, there's sort of a, a pocket here um, in Southern Connecticut um, that you could collect plants from. But at the moment, most of our plants that I'm collecting seed from are from uh, land trust properties. Um, so we're finding seeds there and then uh, doing some seed swapping with some of the land trusts or other organizations. Um, but most of our seeds are coming from, from Connecticut and specifically Greenwich area. That's great. That reminds us that the plants don't know the borders between Connecticut and New York. But with the Green Fingers Garden Club, Karen, do you, when you advise and help with planting, do you consider the seeds that are produced from some of these plants? Uh, we do. Actually, we are working with the Land Trust. Um, I know with Dan has a program. I think in the next couple of weeks we're um, collecting, and, and I think, Dan, maybe you can go over that. Uh, we're going to be doing some planting of seeds and um, in the little greenhouse. <clears throat> Um, I do know just in terms of garden clubs, we, we've actually worked closely with the Greenwich Land Trust, our club, uh, Green Fingers, um, planted a native pollinator garden around the, um, up at the, at, at the Land Trust. Um, so we work with the Land Trust and, and other conservation groups, but um, yes, we specifically have been working, I be, and you can expand on that, Dan, if you want to add something. I think there's something going on in the next week or two with our club. Yeah, we're going to be doing um, some, not just native planting, but also possibly some seed processing. Um, and if anybody watching is interested, I'm also going to be leading a, um, a seed collecting and propagating program, basically, uh, sort of a how-to um, in October. So if you go to the Greenwich Land Trust website, um, you can uh, check that out. But that'll be basically teaching people how to collect seeds from your local environment and propagate them the next year. Um, to plant them out so you don't have to rely on nurseries and you can get local stock. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of wonderful uh, sites to keep in mind 
people want to continue to learn about all these great opportunities. And Myra, there's a question here for you from an anonymous attendee. They consider themselves a novice, sort of a weekend warrior, and wondering what's the what's easy to do so they get a sort of immediate gratification to the help. Or they're asking, should they plan sort of long term? What, what would you advise? Well, I think what I'd say is that here we're moving into the fall season, and this is a good time to think about what what you'd really want and where you would like to put some pollinator plants and start preparing your beds now. Um, I, where, where we, if you visit the pollinator pathway website, we'll have a video on there that shows you how you can prepare a bed. Um, it's a, just a really quick video. Um, and the one plant that you might consider planting it you know you have to wait till next spring just that's i think that's just the reality is um that chive or an onion plant uh, their flowers attract lots of uh, insects and um you get the benefit of of the onions yeah may, may i add on to that i'm just um, a, a big gardener as well um about seven years ago my entire backyard was pretty much Actually, 10 years all lawn and I decided I was going to just dig up part of the backyard and I started with um, a big rectangle in the middle of the yard and um, tried to plan ahead in the fall what might look nice and come up you know I was looking for plants that would come up in the spring and then then some wildflowers some black-eyed Susan and echinacea different things in the summer and then I have asters for the fall so I try to think of all three seasons. Um, since then I have dug up others. <laughs> I think I have now about 10 squares that I've dug up lawn in my backyard and it's fabulous. Myra's been over to my garden uh, and Alex and it's been so much fun and it's really been a, a learning experience and the nice thing is if there's something you don't like or if it goes wrong you can always dig it up and move it and it's just a it's just been a really really fun experience and I've been doing it for about 10 years now. That's right that's some great tips too that you can get that immediate gratification by getting started on a project but planning long term for what it will look like so thank you both very much. Um, it looks like maybe this question could go to Dr. Greg uh, who had the beautiful pictures of nice butterflies but they're asking they want to contribute how do they attract how do they avoid attracting stinging insects oh that's uh that's a challenge um many of our pollinating insects uh you know particularly in the hymenoptera which is the bees and the wasps uh the females they have stingers and the males don't sting um it's it's really uh it's a matter of, of choice um, in terms of where you place your plants. If you don't want your flowers too close to your house for that very reason, then certainly I would I'd plant them further backward, you know, back toward the, the other side of a, a piece of property or in the back of a, a garden. Um, but, but yeah, they're just as important. It's, it's just a matter of being cautious maybe when you walk through the area and also how you place your plants. I, I would like to pipe in, um, it's a little counterintuitive, but the more pollinating plants that you have, the more things that are in flower, the more stinging insects are going to come um, that, that can sting. But because there's so much food for them uh, to forage on, they're going to be too involved eating to really be bothered by you. Um, so. Uh, that would be my one comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd like to pipe in. I have so many pollinator plants right now. I have just about five. Actually, we have two beehives in our backyard, but I have so many varieties of bees that are all over the sedum right now going crazy, and they have no interest in me, and I'm gardening two inches away from them, and they're happily sucking on the nectar. Um, might be, I have a beekeeper who works with us who comes over and um, does not use any gloves and is very gentle. So the bees are not looking to, they'll sting you if you bother them, if you knock them, but basically they are, as Myra said, they're interested in, in, in finding their nectar and not really stinging you. So I have not had a problem with a lot of bees in my garden. 
Yeah, that's good to keep in mind. Uh, keeping calm and the bees will stay calm as well. And here's a question from Gina, uh, maybe for everybody. Let's see, I have a bamboo surrounding my yard that is not mine to take down and I'm trying to uh, plant native species to make a pollinator garden. How realistic is it to compete with the bamboo? Yikes. <laughs> Well, I would like to start with uh, that uh, if this bamboo is along your property line, there's regulation, a state regulation in Connecticut, that if uh, your neighbor is causing uh, the bamboo migrating on your property, the neighbor is responsible for containing it. And in such case, um, what the, the neighbor is supposed to be doing, either removing the bamboo from your property and his or her property, but also they can install a root barrier, which is uh, deep enough to stop the spreading. And in such case, they can maintain the, the bamboo along your property line. I mean, some of, some of my experiences with, with bamboo is um, they're heavy feeders and they, they pretty much take every nutrient and water source out of the soil. So even if it's not necessarily growing in your yard, the proximity of where the roots spread to, I've had a lot of challenges with bamboo, just taking every nutrient and water out of the soil to where you're left with just kind of like almost sand. It's amazing how heavy feet, how much of a heavy feeder they are. Yeah, they're, they're pretty invasive too. They, they move rapidly. We had a neighbor whose bamboo got out of control and they finally ended up up there with a tractor and it's, it's not easy to get rid of either, I might add. Yeah. Um, a tough, tough one, tough one to have, tough problem. And now we have a question from Kate asking what pesticide-free alternative can you suggest instead of mulch? Oh, uh, leaves. Leaves, they are, um, I always say leaves are worth a penny a piece in Greenwich because of the industry that's around them. They are so valuable. Um, keep your leaves and spread them on your uh, garden beds. They they nourish the soil, they keep the moisture in, they keep the weeds down, um, and they're really attractive. They're natural. They're natural color, um, and they also provide some habitat for um, creatures. Okay, thank you. And if I can jump in, um, yep. we actually offer every single fall, cons the Conservation Commission offers a program on, on how to mulch mow um, leaves and also incorporate the grass clippings. So we're going to have another program uh, this year. We're doing this uh, with collaboration with Parks and Recreation. And this is actually a great thing you can do for your yard because leaves are nature treasures and they basically full of nutrients. They're coming down from the tree and you would like those nutrients to go back to your soil so you don't have to go and buy fertilizer. Um, so uh, mulching mowing is a big thing and if you have just regular mower don't be discouraged. You can go over them several times with regular mower or all it takes is to uh, buy mulching blades and you can just replace your existing blades or if you are in a market of uh, buying a new mower just make sure that this is mulching mower and then you don't have to blow them you don't have to worry about them you basically go over the layer of leaves and if you have an excess because sometimes you may have large trees what you do then you can take your rake i will not recommend blower because uh, if it's not electric because uh, pollutes the air um, and then you just basically rake them towards your planted beds and they supply a beautiful mulch and you would like to um, protect your plants for the winter, especially your evergreens. If you have your hydrangea, if you have your rhododendron, they are very sensitive to, to cold wind. So you would like to protect their roots. And once you protect the roots, you also protect the soil. You, you preserve the moisture inside and um, um, just keep your uh, whole garden healthy and um, nutrient rich. Alex, may I just add uh, another use when I have an excess, when I have a good amount of leaves, there's always extra. I put them over on the side and I use them uh, to mix in with my compost. And uh, it's a great source. I just um, have my food scraps, um, and which are pretty wet, and I add uh, leaves to it. And I must say, I just have amazing compost and I have it at the side of the property. So it's another use for those leaves. They're fabulous for your 
compost. Wonderful. And then how about for a last question, something going forward. Um, uh, we have a question about the event next week for Alex. Where's the entrance to the site you park? And in, in addition to that, somebody else was asking about possible signs that they could put in their yard that they want to be part of a pollinator pathway. Um, so thank you for this question. Um, uh, the first thing, uh, so we are planting on Tuesday and Thursday, starting at 9. The location is 393 North Street. Um, so it's north from uh, North Street School. You're going to see us because we are going to be along the, uh, the road. So uh, it's, it's going to be impossible to miss us. Um, the second uh, question was about, uh, what was the second question? Uh, possibly putting a sign in their yard that they oh, yes. want to be part of a so, program. So we have those signs uh, for the, to certify your partner's pathway and Karen is responsible for it and she is leading the program. So what you have to do, you have to contact us, we'll go out, we'll, we'll evaluate your garden and actually you can benefit from meeting with us. We are going to have masks and apply social distancing because we can advise you what else you can do and how you can improve your garden. Karen, would you like to add something to it? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'm anyone's welcome to come visit my uh, pollinator garden that I created, just give you some ideas on things to do. But I have a sign at the end of my driveway. Uh, there are several um, people in my garden club who uh, have signs who qualify. And the idea is to just get that little visual on your mailbox or whatever, just to show that you are... Um, eco-friendly and have pollinators and I just think it's a nice thing to just remind people that uh, people have have seen mine and 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 have taken notice and I think it's just a nice nice thing to show and try to encourage people to do the same and be more eco-friendly. Thank you all again so very much uh, Dr. Greg, Alex, Karen, Myra and Dan for yeah. discussing the pollinator pathway and everything going on in town and what people can do. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the Q&A questions but I did copy them and I can share them with our panelists so they're aware of the questions coming into town and this has been a great hour. Thank you so much everybody and thank you to our great uh, audience for attending today. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank, thank you everybody. Thank you. Take good care everyone. Wow.